Berkeley a partir de 1994. Trabajó en el Departamento de Materiales del Laboratorio Lawrence Berkeley a partir de 2008. Ha recibido diversos premios en Estados Unidos y a su vez ha destacado en el ámbito internacional. Les informamos que unos minutos antes de finalizar la conferencia pasarán a recoger sus preguntas en los papelitos, por favor. Bienvenido, doctor. Ah, muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Uh, me siento muy honrado de participar de aquí. Gostaría de agradecer mucho a los estudiantes, al comité organizador. Uh, pero no se preocupe, porque no voy a hacer la palestra como yo portuñol, porque no, no creo que vas a entender muy bien. Por tanto, voy a cambiar para el inglés. Espero que el inglés con sotaque y eh, con acento brasileño no sea muy difícil. Por tanto, uh, uh, vamos a cambiar para el inglés. Uh, thanks very much for the, for the students, the organizing committee. I feel honored, first time I'm coming here. Not to Mexico, I've been to Mexico before, but uh, I'm delighted to be here. Hopefully it'll be the first time of many of, of interactions that we could have. Uh, I hope to see some. I've seen a lot of people coming to Purdue, not so many people to Berkeley, so we should correct that. Yeah, a little bit, you know, balance. A little bit of balance is always good. I'm kidding, Purdue is a wonderful place, so is Berkeley. And my challenge was to meet, oops, sorry, the requirement of the organizing committee because I was asked to target students, professional engineers, architects, senior scientists. Wow, and everything in close to 70 to 80 minutes kind of challenge to do everything. So, you know, we were trying to do a multitask and I said, you know, I'm gonna present things that I like. So I hope you like as well. And some of the recent work that we are doing and in particularly something that started as a curiosity. You know, sometimes it's great you can follow your passion and academic life allows you to do that. I always like history, history of science, architecture, and even though I'm a professor in civil and environmental engineering, I think that interactions with different fields is key. Uh, and also enjoy, I love to work with a different uh, expertise, experts in different areas. So I started playing with Roman concrete almost a decade ago. And it turns out that in the last two or three years, all in a sudden, it became a major area of research. You got money for that. And it's like, wow, isn't it amazing? You got money to pay things that you start as a hobby. And you can go to Italy, enjoy. Uh, so I will start going for that, and also because they were pioneers in concrete technology. But uh, you don't want to hear only history in itself, so I will give you a little bit of a taste of a very advanced research that we're doing in concrete science. And then we change gears again, move to green concrete, and a couple of applications that's happening in the Bay Area. So I hope at least you like one of them. Now let's see what's happening with the Roman concrete. I don't know how many of you had the chance to go to Europe, visit the really magnificent um, work that the Romans did it. Fantastic work. Um, one of my favorites, and I, I suppose most of them in terms of concrete technology, the Pantheon. Remarkable structure. It was designed to some degree by Adrian. Now Adrian was peculiar in many ways. First of all, nobody, it's 100% he was the major designer, but there's no question that he loved architecture. And indeed, he succeeds uh, Trojan. Trojan died without um, a hair, uh, without son, so basically he inherits the empire. But at that time, he was a nobody when he was a teenager. And he loved uh, architecture, in particular domes. He loved to do domes for everything. And, but the royal architect was sick and tired of Adrian and started calling him uh, the pumpkin boy because the pumpkin, everything was dumb, you know, pumpkin, and Adrian never forgot that. This architect never found any good job ever since he became the emperor on that. Even though Adrian was a very nice, uh, by all accounts, a very fair, one of the wise emperors at the time, you should be, uh, no, what's the message here? Be kind to people. Uh, so you never know how it goes. So the fact is, sorry, I have to get the PowerPoint here. Now, this dome is incredible, unreinforced concrete. Look at the diameter, I mean, 43 meters. Without reinforcement, remember, concrete is weak in tension, a factor of 10 as compared to compression. But the Romans did everything correct on that. 
very strong at the bottom as it moves up, decrease the load. And it took a long, long time. Uh, even the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, uh, which is another marvelous construction, didn't reach this. It was, well, originally was 31 meters. Because of reconstruction nowadays, it's 30.2 uh, meters. Fantastic as well, in itself. And look at the amount of time it, that it took until Bruno Lasky uh, managed to overcome it. And you see how important it was to break these records over 1,300 years. And, wow, two meters. Uh, so just to show the importance of the room. And, and of course, Bruno Lasky knew that. I mean, there's two meters were like, whoa, pushing to the limits. And again, it, there's no cracks here. So anyway, uh, so what was the secret of uh, the Roman concrete? People know it was basically the ash that comes from uh, this a small city of Pozzuoli, very close to Vesuvius. So here we have Vesuvius, the Naples, and the small city of Pozzuoli. Pozzuoli is still alive, still there. Um, Sophia Loren, who probably you don't even know the, the Italian actress, was born there. Uh, so that's the recent claim to fame. But in terms of concrete technology, the material that came from the city of Pozzuoli, that was the best one, it uh, basically was the source that basically exported all over, well, at that time there was no Italy, but in the Roman Empire, and it continued all the way uh, to the construction of Asia Minor, and you see the Roman concretes going all over the places in itself. Now, other aspect that's quite interesting is that the Romans were not the first one to use, quote, the Pozzolanic material, because you have, and that's why sometimes you hear uh, that concrete has been around for close to, I don't know, um, depending how you go, 17 centuries. But that's pushing the limits. There is some indication that in Crete they used some ashes, but the Greeks knew about it because they used uh, in the roads uh, Santorin. There was a big explosion uh, on the volcano in Santorin, and amazingly big one. You can see even in kind of biblical terms, you see the big separation of the oceans. People claim that no, it's quite possible it was because the big explosion in Santorin creating this very reactive ash. But I have to admit that the Greeks were not outstanding, oh maybe, they were really good engineers, but not as good as the Romans. They're fantastic architects. And I made this statement, I forgot that I have a student from Greece who almost killed me towards my lecture because how dare I say, and I said, well, look around, you see a lot of cracks in architecture for the Greek times. And it has different priorities. The, the Greeks were philosophers, beauty, intellect, the art science, and you have Archimedes, and it's basically indicated, he basically said the reason there is nothing written by him because he considered the engineering because he was in the mindset of the Greek philosophers, that's nothing. Engineers do, do nothing. I mean, they make life better, but can you compare somebody like Plato, Socrates, an engineer? Well, it depends. Sometimes quality of life is extremely important, but not so much for the Greeks. Therefore, they did not perfect this uh, pozzolanic material, the Roman concrete. So let's move again to what the Romans did. Vitruvius was the ultimate engineer, wrote, very famous book that uh, if you take uh, architecture course, you're gonna be seeing that. Now you got to see that. Wow, Vitruvius, the best engineer that the Romans ever had. Nobody knows exactly when he was born. Nobody knows when he died. Everybody knows everything about obscure emperors who were basically maniacs, killing people, but uh, the best engineers. So what's the message again? Engineers sometimes do not get the credit that they deserve and yet their contribution lasts much longer than any emperor. Uh, so here he goes, I'm just quoting, you don't have to read. Uh, Baia is basically the location of the Pozzoline uh, city. So he knew everything, the, the words are absolutely correct and he was very clear and very specific in testing different ashes because one ash is good, but if you go a few kilometers away, well, the ash was not as good because depending on the cooling rate. So he, he basically labeled all the ashes very precisely. And he was, oh, I have to go back because he was particularly intrigued 
to have piers to be constructed in the sea. They would just dump concrete, and the concrete would harden underwater. Isn't it something that only recently you have trendy concrete, self-consolidating concrete, but the Romans were doing. And you're gonna be seeing why this is important. So anyway, um, I thought basically said, well, why I'm going, what's the driving force? It's gonna be a little bit my own perspective, why I got about it. So Vespasian and, and Titus were basically the big emperor at the time. Um, they were quite rich. Vespasian was really a rude man, you know, not polite, and, and his son was, you know, just touch feeling, wonderful person. Vespasian was really into the money, so it was one of the very classic stories that you probably heard about it. So Vespasian wanted to bring more money uh, so he could build these lasting uh, monuments, and so he decided to have a tax. If somebody would pee in the you know, or do something really bad in the um, whatever location, in the office is close to, they'll pay, pay five coins. However, if somebody very pious would go and pray next to, uh, to a huge um, facility, you pay five coins. And the son said, I don't understand, Father. Why should you charge the same amount for somebody who is disrespecting you and one that came and praise you and pray for the gods. And Titus is like, oh, you know, difficult to, to have these kids nowadays. He grabs five coins on one side, five coins on another one, they shove to the face of Titus and say, smell. Do you, do you smell any difference for the money that comes from somebody who disrespect me or the money who came here to honor? No. Therefore, he got so much money and he created uh, the, the Roman Colosseum. Now, in history, you, you hear that um, among very peculiar things they've done it, they would flood. That was the claim. They would flood and simulate in, uh, naval battles. Is it true or not true? Well, it's possible. And so I was approached a oh, long time ago, 10 years ago, by the Discovery Channel. They were going and recreating an unsolved history. It was was basically done by a fairly famous historian that selects, you know, uh, different what was inside Hitler's bunkers, White House, Custer. Well, I was the number 13. I don't know if it was a, a good number or not, but it was so much fun because they put quite a bit of money. They collect officially materials, and the question they ask is that, is it possible that the Roman concrete would be used for the Colosseum such that they could simulate these uh, battles. Well, by the way, if you want, you can probably download for free. I'm not um, supporting that, but you can get probably uh, all of this uh, through the internet. It was a very interesting project, and we discovered that it so happens that the Romans decided not to use their best material, this Pozzolanic concrete, how you know? This is from the Colosseum. This is for a system that would be holding water and has been holding water for close to 2,000 years. Now, the Romans knew quite well if it has to hold water, they didn't expect for 1,000 years plus. But uh, in this case, it was 2,000 years. You see how dense the structure is. If you do x-ray diffraction, don't worry about that. Just some of the details. You can see that the material is very amorphous. And this one is very boring. So in other words, they did not invest, again, with the whole concept, Vespasian knew that there was no need to have the best concrete in the Colosseum. Um, and of course, um, it so happens that uh, people at the Discovery Channel did not like so much my, my conclusions, but they still kept me for eight minutes or 10 minutes on, on, on the show, which I was thankful because I did another one for them because they, this one was so successful that they did one on the Trojan um, Wars. We simulate the breaking of the walls and everything else. And I spent two days being interviewed. I thought it would appear like the big star, half an hour. And I appeared for something, if you, if you blink, you do not see me anymore. Because at that time, Brad Pitt had the big movie Troy. And they ended up having 40 minutes of Brad Pitt almost information. And I was basically, again, move aside. So, uh, that's, again, the reality of engineers. You're replaced by Brad Pitt, or um, th that's okay. You can live with that. So, uh, oh, and by the way, even with the Discovery Channel, you can always do something. This was a fun project, sure. Nothing. They didn't pay anything, but they collect 
real material. So all of a sudden, you can do kind of nice science, and we published in a fairly well-respected uh, product, and I thought that was the end of it. But more recently, there was great interest in designing things for 2,000 years. For instance, nuclear power plants that are generating a lot of waste products you have to store for over a long period of time. Modern concrete is, well, 200 years if you push and extend the concept of modern Portland cement. So you can do modeling, but you're extrapolating a huge amount of time for that. And it so happens that the Roman concrete is very ecological because they basically use uh, materials that are locally available. So we started doing all of this research for this. And I said, well, why not? So now, oops, am I aiming? So again, isn't it great that you can now justify going to Europe and collect more samples for that? So this is from Rome and the Trajan uh, market. You go and you get some samples. Now, uh, almost there, most of you, if I just ignore this part, just show this. Wouldn't that look like a regular concrete? I mean, fine, a fine concrete, nothing special about it. And more interesting, this one I did not participate, but I got the samples. Uh, people went to the bay and started collecting uh, samples from um, all the marine structures, the one that the concrete dump without any concern, just in the alkali, the chlorides, very nice, nasty chemicals. And sure enough, you get the cores, and the cores look absolutely great. Again, look, this is coming from after 2,000 years. Again, um, if I take away all these names here, it looks like a regular concrete, perfectly fine. Well, 2,000 years. I certainly cannot guarantee that my best concrete will last 2,000 years. I don't know. We don't know the stability. So we start doing some classical characterization, scanning letter microscopy, point source. This is type of thing. It's, it's routine type of. But we decided to take the next step. At that time, we were doing, oh, you see how fast it goes? Because normally I give a lecture that takes, I don't know, half an hour, so you have to move things very quickly. Now that I had so much more time, I should go in slow motion to, for you to appreciate. This is basically in the Bay Area. Um, can you show again? Um, I'm sorry, can I go back? Oh, maybe I, I can do it by here. Uh, maybe I should just, oh, you see the Golden Gate moving, San Francisco, Bay Bridge we're gonna be seeing, Berkeley campus, and there we go. This is the location where we're gonna be a lot research been doing, it's, it's not only for the Roman concrete. We are doing this for real science in other materials, but I said, well, why not study the Roman concrete? And that was kind of interesting. Let's go back and now take a step back on the more fundamental. For now it's for the physics type of thing that you probably seen a long time. Again, visible light will be here. If you want to image high resolution, you start going hard x-ray, soft x-ray. Happens to be in the wavelength of nanometers. Wow. You can start seeing the nanostructure of the material, and that's what we, our goal was. So the process is very simple. You accelerate the electrons, electrons start rotating, rotating, and then moves to a bigger circle, and every time an electron changes direction, it generates an X-ray. So we can do very sophisticated X-ray analysis in different of these beam lines. Now, this has been around for some time, and this is uh, X-ray microscope. Looks very simple, right? I mean, it doesn't look like your high school biology that you just go, you come visible light, have a lens, a condenser, you have the sample here, another lens to magnify, and you take a photograph. Or you can just look. Nothing special. However, we are dealing with X-rays. And X-rays are complicated because they do not have the lens, optical lens do not work. So you have to have this concentric circle. If you, again, remember your old physics, you have uh, Fresnel uh, diffraction. And for you to, and that's an interesting deal because all the physics for X-rays was fully developed in 1938. A German professor wrote the fundamental book, 600 pages of X-ray optics, and the conclusion was kind of sad. Beautiful theory never gonna be applied in their life because you have, to, they got the conclusion quite correctly that you have to create a spacing for this lens in, with a spacing of 50 nanometers, 20 nanometers. It was unthinkable at that time, but nowadays you can do it. You can do what's called a nanowriter, you can create this lens. 
So we can study um, cement hydration in real time. There. You see, you can see the chemical reactions as it holds. So you can see that you can imagine that a cement company or a chemical admixture said, oh, I want to develop a chemical admixture and I can see the reaction in real time. Isn't it amazing? There is no other technique because if you put an optical microscope, you see nothing because you don't have the resolution. But here you can do it. Wow. That was a, a significant breakthrough. It was some years ago that we did it, the work, or um, 10 years ago. But there is a limitation on that. It's a 2D image. Ah, in 2D image, when you do in nano size, you can have artifacts. So let me ask you, how many animals do you see? How many animals are there? Let's wave. How many votes for two? Well, let's say zero. It should be less than four, I imagine. Well, let's constrain the problem. Four, four or, or less, or, and greater than zero. So how many, and oh, by the way, none of them are Photoshop. Real photographs. So how many animals do you vote for? How many for two? I don't know all your names. You have one vote for two. Yay, excellent. Oh, two votes. Oh, you're for three. Oh, oh okay, no, let's, let's go in an order way. How many for two? For two, oh, okay, right. And I didn't say this right answer, that's good. We're getting better response, three. Okay, not as many. Four. Okay, Evelyn, well, nice, great. Well, it so happens that, well, I, uh, it, I, I present recently, I, I love this photograph, so I'm very biased. I gave one in a color polytechnique and there was a mathematician and he gave me the right answer in such a bizarre way that I still don't quite understand. He basically computed the angle of vision and he said, oh, this, well, if you look around, you can see the, the shadows. That's the way you, you identify. And one of my students said, well, I never heard in my life a rhino with two heads. So that should be fake. <laughs> and, and this one probably you did because um, some of these animals can have, and indeed they do have some mutations. So it so happens that you have three. Isn't it amazing? In real life, for large objects, oh, you can say I can move sideways, or you can have this reasoning uh, rhino. Yeah, uh, well, doesn't large animals, people die, I mean, not people, but certainly animals will die. Uh, so in this case, and you see the shadow, but if you take in a traditional image at a nanoscale, you, you don't have this database that the brain is absolutely wonderful to decouple. Now, so we start doing nanotomography with, with this material. So there we go. Complicated deal because you have to rotate. One thing is to do the CAT scan in your brain, not difficult at all. You go, and, but you have a resolution of one millimeter, which is fine for the neuros, neurosurgeon. It's fine. You don't have greater precision than that. Here we talk uh, resolution of, uh, let's see, this one was uh, 15 nanometers. Not bad. So each one of these images, I will, I will, I will show in a video. I hope the video works. Ah, okay. So here we go. We can rotate in all directions. So this is the Roman concrete. First time to, uh, that has been characterized. And if we can do it, oh, I'm sorry, can you can even do better. You can do all the mathematical manipulation. You can see the connection. Uh, are the crystals connected or they're separated? How they branch it out? So, you, know, you, can, you can have wild uh, time on that. And people do. And you can do spectroscopy. We identify that some materials that the Romans have, you don't find in real concrete. It's called, for instance, this perbermolite. I'm not going to enter into chemistry in itself. But let's go back, actually, for this one. What would be the mechanical properties of this crystal? Mm, that's a tough business. How are you going to measure the strength of nanocrystals? Now, I imagine that all of you went to a lab and have a piece of concrete and bang, right? We're going to break uh, your bridges. Are you going to break the bridges, right? You're not going to measure just the flat. Anyway, you can get a sense. You'll see the... You go theory of elasticity, you see the displacement, fine, or we can put LVDT in a cylinder, and you know the load, so displacement, get the slope, elastic modulus. How are you going to do this? These things are less than one micron, and yet they are all over the place, and you want to know the properties. So for the last eight years, uh, our group, oops, sorry, did I? Ah, there we go. 
we are dominating this field and we borrow the game plan of geophysics. People in geophysics are using this technique for the longest time. They want to simulate the conditions on the Earth. So you apply high pressure and you send X-rays. So interesting, you put in between two diamond cells a very small crystal. So you know the pressure, all right? And with X-ray, you can see how the atomic spacing changes. So your string gauge will be the, as you compress, it gets smaller. Is it, isn't it a cool deal? And again, um, all these crystals had been around for at least over 100 years in all the phases for concrete, and nobody studied that. We characterize every phase for concrete. Uh, we study calcium hydroxide, etringite, monosulfur aluminate. So uh, if any of you would be interested in that, probably too much details, but, we, uh, but nobody has done also for the Roman concrete. So there we go. I'll go a little bit faster because you don't care for the details, the anvil cell, how much pressure they can go. Wow, huge amount of pressure. Uh, again, you have to go for this. You have to be a little bit more careful because you're using large displacement, so you have to use Kirchhoff stresses, which you probably never going to be seeing these again. But the point is that you can do this stress train diagram, and sure, look at the bulk modulus that we measure. Wow, we got very high bulk modulus. So the Roman concrete had crystal that had really very high strength. Well, it's not really strength, you're measuring elasticity, but typically there is a very close relationship, something that's very stiff, tend to be strong. Uh, so what did we learn? We learned these new phases, and, and a bit more, we can see the, so the, what's the message? That pozzolanic materials can be really good, it has very long performance, and I will I'll tag along with the concept of pozzolan shortly. So keep in mind, this is the message. Roman concrete made with natural porcelain produces very good long performance material. Good. So having that in mind, oh, to my surprise, you never know what your research is going to get the audience. Sometimes you're going to say, wow, two years ago we published a paper in one of the most prestigious journals uh, on shales with Professor Barimbla. We have it published in Proceedings Academy of Science. We thought, oh, everybody going to love this, shales. We got maybe two hits, two interviews, and that was the end of it. The Roman concrete, it went viral last year. It was incredible. I mean, this is just a small part. I was in Singapore when the papers came, and somebody got my cell phone number, uh, I don't know how, and called me at 3 in the morning, and like, oh, Roman concrete, you know, you're like, what? And I don't even know if I answer in Portuguese or English, because usually, only people, only probably my, par uh, my, my mother or my sister will call with emergency at 3 in the morning. They're like, what, what? And oh no, we want to know more about Roman concrete. And you get all these bizarre things because some of them are very prestigious with nature, worlds, nature materials, blah, blah. And some of them, very peculiar. I mean, internet gets very unusual characters. A couple of them start saying, ah, you unlock the secrets because the cement companies are really hiding the secret for 200 years. They don't want, uh, which is garbage. I mean, it's not true. Uh, the cement company would be happy to use some of these materials, but so you have all of these response. So I mean, again, what's the point is that sometimes you do things for fun and you hit the jackpot. But sometimes if you go the reverse way, try to hit the jackpot and to get the ma matching research, bad idea really go what you think is interesting, and, and sometimes you miss, some, but most of the times you don't. So now, let's go to the future now. Let's move back forwards a thousand years. What are the new challenges? Well, you have to increase durability of concrete, special mixtures, and the whole concept of sustainability. My concept of sustainability is very narrow. It's materials related. So we talk about green concrete as a construction material narrow, so just kind of preventing questions what it is and what's not. So in our case, it, but we do have a very important claim because of the water demand. Look at these numbers. I mean, I always say an engineer should have order of magnitude. I'm never going to ask any of my students to memorize numbers, but get a sense. Look at the numbers. See the population? What's the population? What, seven billion people? So basically, it's about three billion uh, 
uh, three tons per year, I have per year. It's a lot of, amount of water, amount of aggregate. So we're depleting quite a bit of raw natural materials, but the big challenge is this one. Now this three billion tons of cement generates close to 3.5 billion tons of CO2. Our industry is responsible in the range from six to 7% of the CO2 that the world produces. It's not sustainable. We just can't continue with this trend. And when I say the trend, because look at this, this is, I plot this last week because I, you know, true, am I being dramatic? Yes, I hope that I want, want to convey the message. This is not that long ago. All the, the references that when you go back, Kyoto Protocol, so on and so forth, this is our baseline. Look how the spiral is going. And the trend is continuing. So you, have, you cannot continue with business as usual. The amount of, this is a classical example. I like mine better. It's more dramatic in a sense. But anyway, you, whatever method you go, if you continue with it, and by the way, all these predictions were wrong. Uh, it's, it was done six years ago. Nobody expected that China would exponentially use the amount of Portland cement. You just can't continue that. I mean, it's, we are getting away with murder. I mean, I can't talk since there is, we are in a family of engineers, architects. We are really in, into borrow time. And honestly, if I would be in government, I would say you better get your act together because we just can't continue as is. So we have to find alternatives. So I'm gonna show you some off the wall alternatives and this is not so much off the wall because it does exist. So this is, a, the idea is completely eliminate cement, Portland cement, done. The, I'll take some time here because it's a very cute idea, I think. So here we go. In, I'll give you the vision for the United States. Uh, oops, sorry. Most, oh, I keep pressing the wrong way. So most of the, generation of CO2 in the US associated with burning coal. I mean, this is huge. So imagine if you just capture the flue gas. The flue gas is that one that contains all the junks, SOX, NOX, uh, CO2, bang. And you pass around into a salt water. It could be a brine water, something that contains calcium and, and magnesium. It could be whatever source. It could be salt water, for instance. And what it happens, you have precipitation of calcium carbonate, calcium magnesium. So in basically, you could solve the pollution pro uh, problem in the United States, just with this technology in itself. And it, it being scaling up. And this idea was very peculiar because, oh, for full disclaimer, uh, I was in the advisory board for this. Uh, I'm not anymore, just, just because, you know, it's fun to work in these startup companies when things are exciting and then when you get a steady state, then a reality check and say, okay, you, you, you need to survive. They managed to get $100 million uh, for investors on this, but they're struggling now a little bit. Why? Because the business model, people were expecting that it would be some penalty. If you pollute, you have to buy some carbon credit. And that was the goal that by, by now, you know, could be, I don't know, $20, $30 a ton. Oh, I don't know, whatever number, but it should be some penalty. Well, what's the penalty nowadays? Zero. So uh, it's basically the technological solution that you can basic, oh, and by the way, this uh, magnesium or calcium uh, carbonates are reactive themselves. So you can have cement spend of it. It's, it's really, it's kind of interesting deal because in terms of technology or oh, probably overall solution, you could scale up and solve good part of the CO2 if you have the willpower. So it's a matter of money. So as long as uh, pollution doesn't cost you much, why should you, why should you worry? And I would be concerned if this company that basically developed some quite an interesting product, I don't know, I don't know if you'd survive. And then again, people said, well, in retrospect, your generation or maybe your kids were like, how come you didn't take any action? Well, again, because as long as there's no penalty here, there is no incentive. Portland cement is way too cheap. Uh, so here we go, self-cementing cement. So here we have what the calcium carbonate. It's when in contact with water, 
It dissolves and forms aragonite. It's a really cute process. If any of you want to know more, oh, you can go to Calera webpage and you can get pretty decent, 4,000 PSI, 28 days. Not bad. Uh, other aspect is the use of geopolymers that you get the, the, the process from the power plant, the fly ash, activate. And you have a pretty good material. But what's the other problem? Even if you find the best solution ever, we are dealing with very conservative industry, and rightly so. We do not know the long-term performance of this material. Why? I mean, would you and somebody, and I was the one, kind of interesting when you have to have different hats, because I did research in geopolymers, and then Chevron hired me as a consultant because they're considering in building. Don't even ask me why, because it doesn't make any sense. But they want to put in a project of $10 billion for storage of um, what, liquefied natural gas. And I said, wait, we are doing small samples. The building code doesn't exist for this material. You don't know the long-term stability. And you're trying to tell me that uh, you're seriously considering in going to Alaska and, and building this. And it's, oh, you know, do the research, validate what it was done in, um, in Australia. And I said, well, I can validate because it's an interesting material. But if you want my expert opinion, um, don't use it. But it's peculiar how these big companies, they, they want to have on the record, they try different materials. So the material worked. But I said, are you absolutely insane? Well, you have to go step by step. Even if you find the perfect uh, replacement part with cement, you have to spend at least a decade studying creep, long-term performance, um, characterization process, curing, and just what happened again. Oh, did I? What this, I mean, for the, I don't know, I should find somebody else to take care of the concrete canoe because I'm, you know, I, since uh, nominally I'm, I'm the, the person with dealing with concrete, I've been doing it for a long time, and so this one, this was a good year, 2009. Uh, Berkeley absolutely was number one, local, regional, and absolutely nailed the national concrete competition. So the next year, they came to me and said, well, they could repeat the same, kind of the same design, change a little bit. I said, what's the fun of that? I mean, they spent, they spent a huge amount of hours, and if you're going to repeat this, what you've done before, uh, I mean, for me, it doesn't make sense. And maybe I'm equally guilty. Try to something wild. If you go, it's a type of thing, if you go bad, this is not life saving itself. Try something new. But they follow maybe too much. Then I said, OK, I'll give you the ideas. You go along. And they test, they decide to go for geopolymers. Fantastic response, response in small samples. Dang, wonderful. And they decide to construct that. Results from the small samples are great. Guess what happened? Ha! So I think that never happened to Berkeley. It broke in half. Why? Because of construction practices. The material dried too fast, didn't pay enough attention. They were used with the previous technology. That's another part. You have to educate all the workers that have been doing this for decades. Their parents used that, grandparents. All of a sudden, you have to be careful on this. Only Stanford used to break all, almost every year. No kidding. They completely gave up on the concrete canoe. But that's the first time, and they were really sad. And what do you do in this case? And I said, oh, you know. All right, so this is a good experience. So I, I put them, because they really, they work so hard on this. And you know, it's embarrassing. I mean, I think they, they won the regional, but when they move up, bang. It, didn't, it, it was not so embarrassing, because it didn't break in the middle of the lake. But when they start putting people, it was a crack, and there was a running crack. And then I put them to work. I said, OK, let's do something exciting. Let's see why it fails. Study the microstructure, study the construction process. And so they got busy, write their individual report, and they're quite excited with that. But never again, yes, in the following year. Do you think they continue on this? Uh-uh. And I said, well, you want to continue? Mm -mm. Go back to Portland Cement. Again, that's basically our process. So, so in this case, I'm going to show you some of the ideas, again, from the Romans. Again, linking from the kind that could used to be a curiosity and it's becoming more popular. Can we borrow the ideas from the Romans using natural porcelain? Why is that? Now, let's see. Let's do a very simple 
math. Again, it's the type of thing that a lot of people do not do back of envelope computation. You have to say, well, does it make sense? We want to eliminate at least, at least 1 billion tons of CO2. Therefore, you have to reduce 1.5 billion uh, metric tons. Why you, you put this number? To try to revert back to 1990. Kind of a goal. Ideally, you would like to do better, but let's, let's be realistic. And what other materials you could use? Fly ash, you don't have that much, and you have so much of slag, and you do the computation, we are missing quite a bit. So one suggestion is try to use pozzolanic material. And I was debating, should I discuss this? Because the original word for this one I was to, I'll give you the research goals, but I, amazingly how much I'm telling you, I, I see that my time, which I thought it would last forever, well, I better speed up a little bit. My research was basically uh, given by Kaus, who was a multi-million dollar project, not only for pozzolanic, but for green concrete. And I was doing a lot of sophisticated work, but I said, well, why not do something practical for them? Uh, and they have a huge amount of this natural puzzle. But then I felt guilty. Why, what should you care about uh, Saudi puzzle? And did a, a search here, and I realized that in Mexico, you do have quite a bit of this material. So might as well start thinking of using some of this natural puzzle. See, the large deposits, raw materials that you can use. So we developed quite a bit of characterization, which I couldn't go a little bit fast, but just indicate it was not kind of you throw the material and hope for the best. No, you have to go incrementally, do the characterization, materials, mix design, and the mix design we did, we did uh, binary, replace Portland cement, and we use also limestone, calcium carbonate. Huh. So all in a sudden, we are replacing more than 50% of Portland cement, that's really good. And the, the materials are cheap, local, ah, not bad. And interesting enough, we are doing self-consolidating material. So another one that flows very nicely. Again, a waste green concrete uh, with very good compressive strength. We, we analyze chloride permeability, gas permeability. And the compressive strength uh, I know it's pretty hard in this lecture for you to visualize, but let's give you a little bit on this side. Regular concrete, the one with a replacement, 30% replacement. Basically, if you wait a little bit longer, 90 days. Oh, that brings me a point. You have to convince your structural engineer friend, well, maybe not necessarily friend, but at least a competent one, that many times you really don't need to wait uh, 28 days. 28 days has been around for decades, but it's nothing magic. Most of the structures will not experience the load until 56 days. So why not, if possible, extend to 56 days? Because this reaction with supplementary material, it's a slower reaction. You're taking away this very reactive Portland cement, and there is a penalty for that. In some cases, if you want to have fast removal of formwork, well, don't use the material, but in most cases, you can. And what about the situation that you only use 35% of Portland cement? Well, yes, there is a big reduction of, uh, of strength, but still 40 MPa. Most 80% of 90% of the structures are done with 35, 40 MPa. So you have this option as well. Now, durability with these materials are absolutely wonderful. They would last and last and last. We did chloride permeability and gas permeability. So again, the message that all of these things work quite nicely. Isn't it an uh, interesting deal? So the conclusions are many, but what's the final conclusion? I mean, I know that it would be unfair to ask you to memorize or even to read all of them. So it's nice to have just a packet of information, is that you can use both fly ash and natural pozzolan, and if you add limestone, which is cheap, industry loves to use limestone, you could use uh, sustainable, durable, self-consolidating, top of the art, and very cheap materials. So green concrete doesn't have to be expensive. So you can have, but, uh, but the message again is that, yes, you can do it, and you should do it, but you have to have technology. So convince your bosses that courses in concrete technology pays off big time. I mean, see the amount of money you can save. The cost of limestone is basically one order of magnitude less than Portland cement. So all of a sudden, particularly in large volumes, 
uh, quite appealing. So let's go for my last part of the stretch. Because suppose you don't like too much of the science, Pozzolanic is not your cup of tea, you really go into construction. So I'd like to discuss a little bit of the new Bay Bridge that has just finished last year. After a long, painful process, I participated in some stages and I got bored to death, or the politics were so intense that you just jump. And I said, then you let five years pass by, and I said, maybe things are better. And I discovered they're not. But then, uh, but the project is really fascinating in many ways. So to give you uh, some of the background on this, so this is really, unfortunately for this bridge, never really had recognition because of the Golden Gate. Had it not been for the Golden Gate, everybody would love this bridge. But you know, it's unfair for this bridge because it's really such nicely designed. Uh, if you think in terms of itself, it's quite long at the time. Um, it, at the time of construction, which was in the early 30s, by the way, they finished in, within four years. And keep the four years in mind when you're gonna be seeing the replacement of the bridge. Kind of embarrassing how long it takes to do it. It consumed 6% of CO at that time. Again, this 1936, uh, 33, I'm sorry. Remember, in terms of historical reason, we talk about recession. So this bridge, besides being very important, it, is, it was also important because it, it, it hired a lot of people, it forced the steel industry to continue production, so it's kind of win-win scenario in itself. Uh, the traffic, it's, it's greater than this now, but let's say close to 300,000 cars per day, give and take. It's here, it's still the, the, the highest in the US. And I can attest to that because I thought that I could almost miss uh, the plane coming here because I got stuck here at five in the morning, five in the morning. It's just like, this is insane. It's, uh, that's another problem. I mean, the whole Bay Area, as beautiful as it is, eventually would, would collapse unless you, I mean, in terms of transportation. But that's besides the point. Oh, but one aspect that's, look at this year again. Just give a little bit of a sense. Hmm, peculiar deal because the military already was thinking the possibility of war. You know, militaries are always thinking about that, and bridges are dangerous for, just indicates in Hawaii, in Pearl Harbor in itself, the fact that you destroy bridges, then basically, and San Francisco US has quite a bit of a Navy presence. If somebody would hit this bridge, it would collapse, or transportation. So this was designed as a military bridge heavily duty, and you have the upper and uh, lower deck, the lower deck, it was designed that heavy duty equipment, meaning tanks, big tanks, could go back and forth. So again, the military was possibly not preparing for, for war, but if war would happen, they would be ready. Kind of, nowadays not politically correct to say, very few people are aware of the specification for this. But anyway, so this is 1989, I'm very thankful that um, in the introduction it was mentioned that my that I started in Berkeley in 1994, it was said, but actually that's when I became full professor. It made me look younger which, than I am, but actually I was fresh. I mean, I was two years into my career when this big accident happened. I mean, uh, it was, I was in a chemical lab with a very young uh, Chinese student completely petrified. And you know what Murphy's Law is? She was having an acid that dissolves concrete in her hands. That's what she, and we see at that time, like insane, all the glass work vibrating. And she froze. And I've done something that now, probably will be politically incorrect, but I physically grab her and we move, I mean, took away the, the acid and moved away from the glass where, luckily, uh, it didn't collapse, but this part did. So I did quite a bit of work on the Cypress, and it was very interesting how everything was chaotic. Uh, San Francisco was not ready for that. Uh, they were not even allowing people to investigate. I was interested in the Cypress for all other reasons doing, well, the Cypress bypass, I mean, the overpass that collapsed like a pancake. Uh, I want to study the properties of the concrete. We wrote some papers, but then I said, well, why not visit here? But it was very difficult because the military, not the military, but the police didn't want anybody to come. Uh, George Bush 
uh, was passing around uh, in all, all the time. So you know what you do? Nothing like being from Latin America. Uh, I create now become the standard. I stop at the bookstore and bought all labels. I, my hard hats with stick labels, official labels. It's not fake, but you know, if they see labels, they put labels in the, in the car, and we look so official that everybody said, move, move. And even people who were, deserve much more than, I know, I was fresh as a professor. Very senior professor could not get access, and eventually they have to borrow. So you know, it's like, nothing like being young and fearless. I imagine if somebody would stop me like, what? Well, those are stickers. We, we are from the university, nothing wrong. And I must admit that uh, being, this is a photograph, I was not here, but it was basically the same day, was one of the scary spots. I don't know how they managed, because I was also here, but there were cars, and everybody was grabbing for life, because the wind was flowing. It felt like 100 miles per hour, and it, when, when they removed and they repaired, they took away the spot, so there was nothing. You're just looking at the ocean and the wind blowing itself. So very uncomfortable place. And I participate in the original Caltrans grant to study what happened on that. I think they just thought, oh, assistant professor, why not, extra body. But at that time, Professor Leismer, seeds, really uh, on the foundation itself, grand power on the modeling. It was really exciting, first class. But eventually, I was the first one to abandon ship because I realized that things would drag forever, and it did. Uh, so if I have one claim to fame is to know when to give up and just say bye, and in a very polite way, I said, you know, then I, I was interested in structural materials, so this was fine, but then, you know, I didn't want to offend anybody. I, my field is really concrete. I think I should concentrate in my area, even though it was fascinating, because the foundation here, this was the problem, always the problem. You know what type of foundation you have here? Yeah, get a sense. It, it's not concrete. It's very deep, I'll come back to this, it was wood. They have, eventually what nailed down is that nobody knew the condition of these wood piles at all. And this soil has the distinguished to be the second worst uh, soil under earthquake loads. Of course, the first one is in Mexico City. This is a second one, a little bit far away, but not, but not much, really. This bay mud, it's awful. So eventually, after a long process, it was, oh, actually, this one turned out to be a fairly good design because if the loads, if this, I don't know, it's, now it becomes a debate, were really designed to collapse this because it released quite a bit of energy. The concern if the energy would move to here, well, then we're talking about big, big problems. But anyway, uh, so here was the new design for the bridge. Uh, kind of fun. I work uh, in different stages a little bit in the, in the Skyway. Uh, for, I studied the creep analysis, we did some mixed designs for them, but I've been working with Caltrans, too many partners, too many moving parts, and this metallic tower, this one I didn't touch. Now, okay, we have two parallel bridges, same size, same capacity. Why? Because we're just replacing one side. It doesn't make sense to put, I don't know, uh, six lanes, seven lanes, and then everything would funnel down to the next stage. So, not so good design. Now here we go, you see this long, now here we talk about fantastic design, we have to go all the way down. Uh, they brought from China one of the heaviest duty equipment to drive these piles. Huge e effort on this. Now the construction process in itself, oh, actually they're supposed to be the same one. I love this, was at that time one of the largest um, precasts, we select this for the cover of our third edition. Now the construction is fairly classical, you build a cover dam, uh, you place the, the, uh, the process, water down, put these big uh, piles, put the concrete, and you see some of the piles, again, 105 meters long. That's really, now driving these piles uh, under these conditions, uh, not a trivial task. So there we go, uh, subway roads. Now let's concentrate a little bit on the concrete side and the construction side. The location was very tight. Very tight. They didn't have much, much room, and also the EPA and the environmental impact was intense, amazingly high. So the challenges, you have to dispose of even the water. They check all the garbage every time, and uh, they would cost $100,000 per month just to remove the garbage. No leakage. 
And there was one guy every hour, or sometimes every day, would go there checking the pH. Why? Because if the pH was high, indicate there was leaking uh, the concrete. Oh, the, the, the pH of fresh concrete, if you recall, is 13. Where if this would go, unfortunately, it would go direct to the bay, fishes would die. So um, those, and also you have thermal stresses. The temperature could be too high. So they use these very special tanks with liquid nitrogen to cool down the temperature. A very classical process of, they try, the classical way is typically to use ice instead of water. They did it, it didn't work as much. And eventually have to use liquid nitrogen. Of course, liquid nitrogen is a tricky business because the temperature of liquid nitrogen is minus 196 degrees Celsius. Wow, really cold. So if the liquid hit, uh, would hit here, you have solid frozen concrete, not good. It happened a few times, but you create a mist that will be, I don't know, minus five, minus 10 degrees Celsius, and it will cool, but not freeze the concrete. Uh, earthquake zone, so you have to use self-consolidating concrete, first time in the Bay Area. Now, which is trivial, remember, just show you self-consolidating concrete with, with green concrete. But when they started seven years ago, again, seven years ago, long time ago, just took so forever for them to finish. Again, oh yeah, 2002, oh, it's longer than that. So, so the trial mix, 2002, they just finished last year. This was the, one of the longest project I ever participated. I participated in many large concrete dams all over the world, but nothing that would take this long span. But it was an interesting deal. You have to transport this through the bay. They built at that time the three largest barges in the world. Again, at that time, Caltrans had so much money that they were burning like no tomorrow. The original design for the bridge well, the very first was half a million dollars. The voters refused because it was too simple. And, and it turns out that um, the voters, everybody had so much money in, well, 15 years ago, money was like no tomorrow. The voters said, we want a signature bridge. Caltrans, okay, fine. It was embarrassing because <coughs> they hired somebody from Miami, and the people in Miami, they do these bridges like freeway on stilts, that's what they call it. Very boring, but very cheap. Uh, so they redesign, uh, expect to be uh, $1.5 billion. The final cost was close to six, and probably they are padding a little bit under. So the delivery barges, development of the project. So the self-consolidating concrete uh, was excellent, laboratories, Everything worked fine, but, ah, you see, compressive strength was too good. Too, I mean, I say very good to be politically correct, but it's not, it was too good. That becomes the problem now with the concrete technologies, the design, and the contractors. And people are designing different things, and not talking to each other very much. So what would be the problem if you have too high of a compressive strength? <coughs> it turns out that was, the owner of a ready mix company that said, well, he sent an email to the design office. Did you really consider that the elastic modulus would be very high? Just, just as a curiosity, and then it was panic time at the design. Because if the elastic modulus would be too high, can you imagine? Again, remember the wave propagation would go and you go to the columns and the piers and it would break down. So it's designed such that it would, if it breaks at, at the connections, uh, they will have everything ready within a month. Now if the column collapses, because the wave propagates and the foundation collapses, forget it. We have to redesign everything. Oh, it's structural, sorry. So again, they have this too much of a high elastic modulus, so panic time, and they end up having this weird, very weird, uh, solution of using 6% of air voids to decrease the strength and elastic modulus. And they got it. Uh, and yet Caltrans, again, uh, the agency that built this, uh, was kind of embarrassed about that. Uh, you know, you don't use this huge amount of air in training uh, unless you are in Canada because of freezing and towing. So Caltrans decided to, to, to spin it and said, oh, you know, we did two things. We reduced the elastic modulus, yes, very true, excellent. 
but they try to spin too much. And uh, they say, oh, you know what? Our concrete is much more durable, which is a lie. Because we don't have freezing action. And again, my, again, my message, stop. At the moment, you're telling the truth. When you start to stretch into a point of, oh, I, I'll rather pass the video. Yeah, um, I see my time is up. They use uh, the epoxy coated bars. Oh, one thing that was fine, I, I cannot buy a bad mouth Caltrans too much. They were being very generous. Every year I will take my students, we will visit there. We saw basically all the stages of the construction process. Uh, so the lessons of the process is that the self-consolidating concrete was good, thermal stress was under control. And I'm just finishing with this few slides to tell a good story on this. This is in Berkeley. We just finished. This was uh, the Morning Stadium. That um, our, our football team is really bad. <laughs> I mean, yes, I don't know, but it's peculiar. Uh, alumni loves to give money. Throw on me. If you try to say, oh, can you give money for research in our field? Nah. Or, or a new building for civil engineering? Forget it. Our civil engineering building, it's lousy. But this one, they put money. And so happens the original design. Uh, the Hayward Fall bisects exactly in the middle. I don't know how they manage, but it was just like if somebody knew, and off we go. This, the fault runs like this. So uh, it's a huge project to retrofit. Okay, sorry. Uh, that's basically the Hayward Fault, and now you have to accommodate these huge displacements. Uh, so basically now these two sections move separately, and if things go well, People get scared, take a big ride, but no significant damage and very few people hurt. But the highlight from the concrete part, just to finalize everything that yes, you can certainly do high volume fly ash, green concrete, use with large amounts and work amazingly well. And basically, uh, that's what I finished. And just to be a little bit, uh, I don't know, maybe selfish, we decided for the new cover of the textbook. Uh, to put Berkeley in a very fade way, the campanile here. You know, maybe it will be the last edition. That's what I said last time. But um, we are very proud of this project. And, oh, and the mixed design was developed originally by my colleague, Matt uh, Prasamata, and we did a little bit of tests on that. So with that, I see that my time is up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good. Ahora empezaremos con la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. If concrete is resistant to compression but not to torsion, how is it that after over than 2,000 years, Roman buildings are still in good conditions even when Rome is a seismic zone? Yeah, that's, we are basically finishing a paper along those lines, peculiarly enough, uh, because uh, there is quite a bit, there is, we, we, to answer this question, I can send the paper, well, first of all, we don't quite know, but they design extremely well under compression. Uh, and uh, what being postulated that some of these large aggregates act as an arching mechanism. They use big boulders in itself. And we, we basically measure, not measure, collect the data. There were at least seven major events in Rome and none of them did any significant damage of this. Or, and maybe if I may extend a little bit, because uh, I think the Portland cement concrete got a bad rap in all of these <coughs> blogs that you've seen. It. Another aspect that the Romans did not use is reinforcement. And reinforcement is the weakness of modern concrete. Corrosion is not happening in, uh, in the concrete, but in the reinforcement. So, uh, but, so it certainly survives. So it's, what's, I mean, you see the, uh, again, the, the, the whole idea of the pumpkin work out quite nicely in South, but beautiful design. And you say we don't have a lot of information of the substitute's performance in long term. Then in what part of the building industry do you think we should start to substitute the Portland cement with fly ash or another Pusulana material? Oh, uh, then I take it back because with fly ash for this life cycle of a building, we have more than enough information for that. So you, you basically could use the fly ash in any part of the building. In San Francisco, the, uh, the, the first building was done at the Gap store because uh, the owner really believed in sustainability and has been uh, basically 50% in the whole building of fly ash. In the campus, we use all over this and we use in the stadium. So 
For fly ash, you can use it anywhere. Uh, now, if you want to design something that of over 200 years, well, then, then you have to do a lot. Then I can give you some recipes, how much you believe in the modeling. You start studying diffusion process for chlorides, which uh, fly ash works very well. And then you extrapolate and see until a critical threshold of chlorides would hit the reinforcement. But concrete with fly ash works very well. OK, thank you. And the last question. The core of the new World Trade Center in New York has a compression resistance of more than 4,000 PSI. What will be the future of the concrete after this? Uh, how, what, which, how many thousand PSI? For 14,000. Oh, that's nothing. Yeah, you can go much more than that. Well, sure. I mean, that's, um, there is, I mean, people in Europe are using close, well, I, uh, now I have to do my conversion because it's in Europe, but they're getting close to 200 MPA. Not concrete elements, but the problem is that the costs will be probably more expensive than steel. So it's not a technological problem. And again, we increase the compressive strength, but we don't manage to increase the tensile proportionate. As you start increasing more and more, same thing with rock.